This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here again. It has been a month uh, since my last session, and I came, I'm came. i coming back here with a very, very, very special person. Um, just to start off my introduction, uh, my guest today uh, uh, has a THM from Harvard University, a PhD in New Testament Studies from Edinburgh, he is a former professor of New Testament Studies, President Emeritus uh, Acadia Divinity College from Nova Scotia, Canada. He was a visiting scholar and professor at Princeton. He has done continued research at Cambridge University and Harvard. He has been a member of the Societas Novum Testamentum Studorium, and he has been the, he was been the, uh, the president of the IBR for Biblical Research. Uh, and this is just a fraction of, of his credentials. In the, in the description link, I will send you a link towards a 15-page resume of, of the, the survive right here in front of me. Uh, unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, we weren't able uh, to, yeah, to show his face. Uh, probably next time, God willing, but it is the content of our speech that why we are here. Uh, Dr. Professor Reverend Lee McDonald, thank you very much for being here on the, on the session. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Delighted to hear. Delighted to hear. As I mentioned before, uh, I was trying to look up uh, a little bit in your past. And I already mentioned before that you were so prolific uh, in the work that you have done. And uh, a couple of months ago, I've read this book, The Formation of the Bible, uh, the story of the church canon from Lee Martin McDonald's. And as you can see, I have my made all my notes. A very delightful book. I would I would recommend this one to almost everyone from no matter what what level uh, they are. Um, so my first question is actually uh, how did it how did you actually came so prolific in this particular field? Where, where did your love for the, the canon of the Bible start? Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, it actually started when I was in seminary. Uh, very little was known in those days about canon formation. Not much had been written on it. And so the professors would generally, in Old Testament and New Testament, we'd read about five pages in an Old Testament introduction or a five or ten in the New Testament uh, introductions. Uh, but uh, they never answered all of the questions. And I asked questions and uh, of my professors and they were very fine people and well-intentioned and it was generally well god was in charge of all of this so don't worry about it get on with your other stuff and uh study the book of romans a little bit better and uh, you'll do fine in life anyway uh, uh years went by but i still had a number of questions and uh i had written a small article for a seminary where i was teaching and then uh uh, I was pastoring a church. Uh, I I love the church, and so I've gone between pastoring and then teaching and back to pastoring and back to teaching for 45 years. So uh, my first choice is always the church. It precedes the seminaries, and uh, but I love the academic uh, world. And I had a student come home from uh, for his Christmas vacation, and he. Um, uh, ask if he could ask me a question. It was during a Bible study at the church. And I said, sure. And he asked me, he said, I just finished a religion course at the university. And uh, I found out there were a number of books that uh, didn't make it into our Bible. Could you tell me why the ones that are in our Bible are there and why we, uh, the church rejected the other books? And as I began to respond to him, I was responding based on what I had studied in seminary, which was wrong. And I kept thinking of exceptions to everything I was telling this young man. And I said, can I get back to you next week? Which I did, but I've been on that subject ever since. It's a very complex area and it deals with, uh, to become proficient in the field of canon formation, you need to understand, of course, the New Testament and the Old Testament you need to understand uh, or have an understanding of the canon lists, the lists of books that were approved by churches to be read in churches and lists of those that were not approved and why. You need to know something about uh, early church fathers and why they cited certain books and not other books. And you need to look at the manuscripts themselves 
to see what books are in them, the manuscripts that have survived. There's about 9,000 uh, manuscripts of the Old Testament that have survived antiquity. And there's 5,700 and about 50, and there'll be more that'll be added to that uh, when some recent ones are cataloged. Uh, but uh, as you look at those manuscripts, there's other books in them besides our biblical books, uh, which is, it never gets much attention by the scholars. They only say uh, P72, for example, that has uh, Jude and uh, first and uh, second uh, Peter uh, in it. And you say, wow, that's nice, but there's 11 other books in that same manuscript and they're side by side. Uh, so uh, knowing that, and then the final area that you need to be familiar with is one that very few scholars get into are the lectionaries. The lectionaries are the scripture texts that were read in antiquity. We have a few of them from the, uh, that you see in the New Testament that are cited, but uh, most of them are not uh, cited uh, until about the fourth century is when our earliest uh, uh, texts come about. And most churches couldn't afford to have a Bible uh, and uh, it was very expensive to uh, put one together. Uh, you'd have a couple of hundred animals that would be used uh, to make the parchments, uh, and the papyrus manuscripts were uh, also very expensive to produce. And most churches would only have one or two books or a handful at most out of all of Old and New Testament. The most popular ones for the Old Testament were Deuteronomy, uh, Psalms, and Isaiah. And those are the most quoted in the New Testament and most quoted by Jesus also, and most quoted among the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were popular books in the first century in the time of Christ. At any rate, as you look at those, the lectionaries let us know what the scriptures were read in the churches. Most of them only had portions of those books, but they didn't have the whole books. And there was a, a Orthodox uh, a uh, professor writing not too long ago, and he talked about the Protologion, uh, the uh, prior books, uh, writings, and uh, he said that's what most of the Orthodox had for Bibles was the lectionaries, and so they didn't have complete books. The first manuscript that has all of the books of the New Testament and no others is about 1000 A.D., uh, some people said, oh, well, uh, there's a couple of manuscripts ahead of time that have all of the books of the New Testament. And I said, yeah, but they also have other books with it. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that you, you need to focus on when you're looking at the question. And as I began to study it, and then another door would open and I'd say, gee, I don't know anything about that. And so I began to focus on that area. My primary training is in New Testament studies but I minored in Old Testament studies, and I've looked at the books that have made it in and those that were rejected uh, for a number of years now. And I started writing on it uh, almost 40 years ago, and so I continue to do that kind of thing today. Wow. Well, th thank you for your answer. And, and, and it, it is a very relevant topic and question that uh, a lot of Christians, or even non-Christians, have with that particular answer because a lot of people think that like one way they have like the bible just dropped out of heaven and that's not the case right so um so you were you the thing about your work in particular is that you really are trying to lay out the hit how it historically has formed that's what i like and uh as as, as your the, your professor said you just read the book of romans like, yeah, it, it is that part as well, but also the historical side is also, yeah, neglected. And yeah, your work has been terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, canon formation is largely a historical uh, issue uh, on how we got our Bible. Uh, but I say at the end of uh, most of my books, the word canon means uh, an authority. It comes from a, a Greek word, kana, uh, uh, a kanon uh, that comes from a Hebrew Semitic word, kana, anyway. Can, can, uh, can, can I say something about that? Uh, I, know, I, I know right before the session, uh, uh, Reverend Lee and I had a, a bit of a, a email contact. In his, in his 
in his prior days, he has been in an Armenian church. And in Armenia, we call a canon something called as, um, how you actually call it? Uh, lineal in Dutch. It's something like this. We have like the centimeters and the stuff, stuff like that, a measuring stick. So also in sure. Armenian, we have used using word canon. Yeah, and uh, it, the, the word uh, that we translate canon by is often rule. And we have a ruler which uh, is used to measure things. And the, uh, uh, the term itself came from a measuring reed that was found on the uh, uh, Nile River in Egypt. It grows there, there uh, uh, the papyrus plants and uh, uh, the reeds for the uh, uh, measurements were dried and then measured. And it was generally from the tip of the finger to the end of the elbow. And we call that a yard nowadays, uh, essentially, or uh, close to a meter uh, for a big tall man. Anyway, those, those terms, uh, I regularly say the first canon or rule of the early church was Jesus. Uh, if Jesus said something, that settled the issue. And so if we ever had uh, a question going on and we found a statement from Jesus in one of the Gospels, yep, that settles it. Uh, no question about it. Uh, but the term canon was not used for a list of books until the fourth century AD with Athanasius and uh, uh, Athanasius and Egypt uh, made use of uh, that particular uh, term. But uh, generally, uh, scriptures is a very popular term, is just holy scriptures or holy books. Uh, uh, our word Bible comes from uh, the plural of uh, the Greek word uh, biblos, biblia. That's the, uh, the term for books. So holy Bible literally means holy books. Uh, those are the kinds of things. I always start my focus on canon with Jesus. And uh, without Jesus, there would not have been a New Testament. There would not have been any New Testament writings because they focus on him and the implications of faith in him. That's what the New Testament does. And so uh, at the end of most of my books, and I've done 11 books and I've got two more coming out on canon, um, the, um, I always say to the folks that are studying that, uh, we've done a historical study, but if you do not submit to the authority of scripture, you don't have a canon, you just have a list of ancient writings. So canon has to do with uh, submission to the authority that we believe God inspired, Christians believe God inspired the Bible to be written. And uh, while we can study it historically and should, there's a place at which we go beyond what historians can say. And then, uh, uh, and where faith comes in, we believe that God was involved in this process. Right. A historian can prove uh, and make a very credible statement that Jesus was crucified in Palestine around 29 to 30 AD. They cannot prove that he died on a cross for the sins of the whole world. That goes beyond what a historian can prove. They probably, and I think credibly, could make a good strong statement for an empty tomb that Jesus was placed in. But that doesn't mean for them that he was raised from the dead. Even Mary, when she saw the empty tomb, John chapter 20, she was confused. And when she saw Jesus, she thought he was a gardener. And she's asking, where have they taken him? And uh, even after the disciples met with Jesus, Matthew 28, verse 17, uh, some praised the Lord, but others doubted. It said, and I say, how could you meet with the risen Christ and doubt? Uh, they were more acting like historians. The uh, historians uh, do not deal with the issue of God or the supernatural. They can say remarkable things happen, but they can't demonstrate that God was involved in doing those remarkable things. I've often used the illustration in World War II, uh, there was a saying going on uh, that God was at Dunkirk. And I heard that as a child growing up that allowed the British uh, people to rescue the uh, British troops and that allowed them to protect Great Britain from an invasion from uh, uh, Hitler. Anyway, 
uh, they kept saying God was at Dunkirk. It was a miracle that they got through. But historians would say so were the British Spitfires because they destroyed all of the airplanes that uh, were going to attack them. So uh, historians will always come up with a natural explanation. And when they can't find one, they'll say it's unknown. Christians don't have to stop there. So anyway, I've gone maybe no, beyond. That, no, that's, that's a very great uh, point you're going to because uh, I've, I've read this book from uh, Gary Habermas, uh, written indeed. And yeah. uh, I, I want to say within two weeks, I have a session with him as well. And one, he has like, the foremost scholar if it comes to the resurrection of our lord and what i want to uh exactly as you mentioned before like historians are working a lot with probabilistic hypothesis but then when the, but then we have like his minimal minimal facts argument and what other explanation besides the resurrection have you like naturalists yeah. they don't have an answer for it so well they do and, uh, and they'll say either, and nobody says the disciples lied because they were willing to be martyred for that particular cause. Or they'll say they were misunderstood, uh, they misunderstood what took place, or they use psychological babble in order to try to explain the transformation in the disciples. They were cowards, they fled when Jesus was arrested, and now they're bold and they're willing to lay down their lives. The church has the answer, which is God raised Jesus from the dead. But a historian never comes to that particular point. And uh, because they're basing their understanding of history on their own experience. And so they ask the question, is it easier to believe that a person was raised from the dead, which I've never experienced, or that uh, they were mistaken? So they says, well, all kinds of people are mistaken about all kinds of things, but uh, not too many people have been raised from the dead. While I was a pastor, I had probably 200 funerals over 25 years, and um, uh, none of them have come back. So my own experience says, uh, if that my experience is the only criterion that I use to evaluate reality, then there was no resurrection of Jesus because he was a human being and human beings, when they get put in the grave for three days or more, they don't come back. So somebody stole the body or the disciples were mistaken. And uh, that's what historians do. But uh, empiricism, the, the argument of David Hume, that only by our senses that we are able to derive what is reality or what is not reality or even yeah. metaphysics. So, but as you mentioned before, not every day is someone rises from the dead. <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, parallels and my experience are a primary criteria uh, for historians. They can't go beyond their own experience. And so they have to come up with some other explanation and most of them can be, you can shoot them down very quickly, but that doesn't necessarily prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. That comes in the encounter of the risen Christ today in the proclamation of the gospel. And I've often chided some of my colleagues who wanted to prove the resurrection. I said, what part of the gospel don't you, uh, uh, can you really prove? Can you prove that Jesus died for my sins? I believe that he did, but I can't prove that to the historian. Right. Uh, be careful of making your experience and the historian's criteria uh, 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 canonicity uh, questions for uh, your whole Christian faith. Be careful of going beyond what you can say. I've written a book on Jesus, uh, the story of Jesus in history and in faith, and that's because so many of the critical scholars deal with history only, and the church deals with faith. Uh, Christ died on a cross. How do I know that? He changed my life. My life was going in the wrong direction. And uh, I was a this or a that, I was a thief, a, a you name it. My life was uh, in, in prison and I heard the gospel, my life was changed. And there's thousands of stories like that uh, where people's lives were transformed. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't know a verse of the Bible, but I heard the message of Christ proclaimed and it changed my life. And I gradually, 
grew. And when I went to church, my grandmother helped me get my first Bible. And I uh, went to church and I didn't know where any of the books were. And I couldn't quote one verse of the Bible, but my life was changed. That was not unlike the early Christian community. They, the church existed before there was a Bible. Exactly. I remind people about that. I've got a book coming out. Uh, it'll be out the end of this year, before there was a Bible. And uh, how did the early church function? Jesus was their mm -hmm. primary authority. Because th that is exactly what I wanted to go towards uh, uh, with this particular session. Because one of the, like, uh, as I so showed you before, here's my King James with the yeah. 66 books. But at the same yeah. time, I also have here my Orthodox Study Bible with sure. uh, the Deuterocanon, which has like the order of the Septuagint, for instance. So if, sure. you, if you are able to, yeah, go on what you were trying to say about yeah. what happened before the Bible. Yeah, well, uh, and, and that'll bring up with your Orthodox Bible, uh, why they have more books in their Old Testament than the Catholics, and the Catholics have more than the, the Protestants do. But uh, uh, there was a tradition about Jesus. When the early disciples met uh, with the followers of Jesus, the apostles met with those who were believers. The day of Pentecost comes, Peter preaches, 3,000 people, and they were meeting together, Acts 2.42, and they were committed to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to breaking of bread into prayers. Uh, anyway, uh, what do you think the apostles taught? They told them about Jesus. They'd walked with him from three to one years, and uh, they believed that he was their Messiah. They had everything to teach about him. Those core teachings about Jesus was what was at the heart of early Christian faith. And there were creeds that were formulated. The oldest creed in the New Testament is Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's repeated and expanded in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, uh, where uh, Paul says, I delivered to you that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and uh, he was seen by Cephas, and last of all, he was seen by me. That was right at the heart of the earliest beliefs. Now, there were lots of beliefs that began to be added to those early traditions, but the New Testament has several creedal formulations. Those traditions and those early creeds were at the heart of the faith beliefs of the early church, and they were repeated in the Eucharistic uh, affirmations, uh, that the church would uh, break bread regularly and they would affirm those core beliefs at baptisms. They would affirm those core beliefs. And they also had hymns. And we were admonished in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses eight, uh, 18 through 21, to be filled with the Spirit is to also speak uh, and sing songs and melodies uh, in your heart. The early Christians also sung, and many of the early Christians didn't know how to read or write, but when you affirm those same statements over, I see in church today where they'll affirm the Nicene Creed or the uh, Apostles' Creed, and there's people never have to look up on the screen to see it or to look in a bulletin. They've said it so many times in churches that it's a part of who they are, uh, and those core beliefs and the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed were at the heart of the beliefs of early Christianity. That Many of them believed other things, but those were the most important. So I, I share with folks, those things were operative and they gave a control. Now, when churches began to meet and talk about which books would be read, guess what controlled the limits of where they could go? If they had a book that didn't affirm the resurrection of Jesus, it was rejected. If they had a, a book that uh, didn't affirm that Jesus died for our sins, it was rejected. So the core beliefs of the church gave rise to the biblical canon itself. And only after Nicaea, and Nicaea uh, is a, the first ecumenical council of the church, it did not uh, speak about any books of the Bible. Or, or, even, after, or, or even the seven ecumenical councils, all of them. None of Correct. them actually addressed the canon. Only local can, uh, councils of churches addressed 
the books to read in their churches. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they affirmed the core beliefs of early Christian faith. And I appreciate that you just said that not everybody knows that. They often say, well, Nicaea settled it for uh, the, uh, uh, can uh, the biblical canon. It didn't. But after that, after there was agreement on most churches, not all of the churches believed what was settled at Nicaea, all of the churches began to, uh, or uh, several church fathers began to make lists of books that could be read. And then those were affirmed by uh, local councils. Hippo was the local councils and uh, Carthage was local councils and, uh, and the Orthodox, uh, when they, the final, uh, ah, yes, you've got uh, some of those lists that, uh, that are there. Uh, they're not all exactly the same. So there was considerable overlap in those lists, uh, especially on uh, the Gospels and most of the books of the Old Testament, but there were some books that were doubted for quite some time. In the Orthodox churches to the east, uh, uh, Second Peter, uh, Second and Third John and Jude were yeah, doubted. By Eusebius, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, uh, not Eusebius, he was not in the Eastern part, the Oriental Orthodox, but it was the Syrian Orthodox primarily that rejected them along with the book of Revelation for several centuries. And uh, the Orthodox didn't accept Re the book of Revelation as scripture until about the seventh to the eighth century AD. And to this day, Orthodox churches, and you would know this, you've never seen the book of Revelation read in a liturgy in an Orthodox church. Correct. It's accepted as scripture, but it is never cited uh, uh, as a part of the canon and used in the liturgies of the church. So it was a, one of the doubted books. The core books of the Old Testament and the New Testament is what informed uh, the faith of the early churches. But uh, some books were held in question for centuries, like the book of Hebrews, like James, like uh, Second Peter. Uh, second and third John and Jude and Revelation. Those were the most doubted books and the others were uh, not all affirmed initially. Initially it was the Gospels that were first seen and that makes sense because they spoke about Jesus, the Lord of the church. And uh, when somebody said, did Jesus say this? And he said, yes, we found it here. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, which was the most cited gospel for centuries. And there's more copies of the Gospel of Matthew than the other three combined uh, that uh, in early church history. But all four were eventually, uh, and Eusebius calls them the Holy Tetrad, uh, the four, uh, uh, his Ecclesiastical History, uh, Book 3, uh, Chapter 25. Anyhow. Yeah, right there, yeah. Yeah, good for you. Um, I'm pleased that you, you have it. But that's... Uh, that was a long process for the church to recognize its Bible, but its faith did not change dramatically from the beginning because those core beliefs that were sung, that were affirmed in the Eucharist and in baptisms, and uh, that were taught in the churches and the creeds that were formulated, gave rise to the books that could be included in the church's biblical canons. Right. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but... No, that, 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 that makes perfect sense. So, but wouldn't you then confirm or agree with the fact that no, any particular moment in time, one person had like the monopoly of the canon? There, there was no such thing like one person having like full authority over the canon, right? Uh, yeah, those were generally, uh, councils generally reflected what was most common in most of the churches in the regions where those councils met. Uh, whether uh, there was a council in Laodicea, uh, a council in Rome. Um, uh, of course, Athanasius wasn't a council, but uh, he was a church father with a lot of influence. And uh, uh, all of those councils uh, uh, overlapped considerably in the books that they accepted. Uh, by the uh, end of the fourth century, early fifth century, most of the churches accepted most of the books, but not all of them, of the New Testament. And most of the books of the Old Testament, uh, Esther was uh, doubted for several centuries by church fathers because the name of God uh, is never mentioned in, uh, in the book of Esther. Uh, 
and uh, there's no prayers to God at all. But later in the Greek uh, translations uh, of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, you do find uh, references to uh, uh, inserted portions of the book of Esther. Uh, and the same thing is true with the book of uh, Daniel. So you do have a number of uh, uh, writings that have insertions play, uh, placed in them. And I, I have a section in a book that I've just completed. It'll be out the end of this year on the uh, what we call anonymous or pseudonymous falsely attributed words to uh, an, an apostle or a prophet. Things that were stuck in the, uh, uh, in the book. You have the King James Bible. There's certain verses in there that are not in any modern translations, like John 3.13, no man has gone up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man who is in heaven. And uh, that part was about a fourth century edition by a very zealous scribe who wanted to make sure that uh, uh, the divinity of Jesus and his omnipresence like God's was affirmed. First John 5, 7, and 8, called the Johannine comma, right. Uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Son, the, uh, the uh, Son and the Holy Spirit. Those, th that was a Latin invention, and it was only put into the Greek Bible in the 1500s by Erasmus. And there's not a Greek manuscript that has it. Uh, those kinds of things, there were insertions all the time. And so uh, they were falsely put into a biblical text. <clears throat> the uh, John chapter 7 verse 53 to 8 11 and the story of the woman caught in adultery it really fits the time of Jesus but probably wasn't an original part of the gospel of John because they have manuscripts without it uh, quite early on so, all right. yeah. this meeting is being recorded this part to you again so thank you all for being again uh, we had a, a slight glitch now, Reverend Lee, you were, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, you were telling us uh, uh, things like John 3.13 or uh, uh, the Johannine Kama, that's Erasmus, interpolated, or there were no Greek testaments or no, no Greek manuscripts that, that had these types of verses. Yeah. Would you like to elaborate that on that? Yeah, I, uh, as we were uh, concluding the previous section, uh, I was saying that... Uh, there were many insertions into the biblical texts by the scribes that copied uh, them over the centuries. And well until the time of the printing press, they were fairly common. There are no two manuscripts exactly alike until there's a printing press. And uh, sometimes the scribes would take liberties and they want to make clear. And sometimes it was just, in other words, they'd use, uh, they'd say to themselves something like, my people wouldn't understand this word, so I'll give another word that clarifies it. And most of the clarifications are fairly easy to follow, but sometimes they want to insert their theology uh, into the biblical text while they're making copies. Uh, so there's no perfect copy made. And uh, I've often uh, uh, smiled at the Christians who say, we depend on the inerrant original manuscripts of the Bible. I said, so where are they? Uh, we don't have them. And uh, the ones that we have, just tell me which one is inerrant and we'll follow that one. Uh, but uh, all of the others are not because how many errors does it take to no longer be uh, inerrant? Uh, just one. And uh, there are lots and lots of mistakes that are made. A person uh, was making a copy of a manuscript and had to run to the restroom or uh, was very hungry and couldn't wait for lunch to get there and he's hurrying to finish a line or he wants to go home and the light was often quite poor. Uh, so m lots of mistakes were made. There are more mistakes in the manuscripts that we have than words in the New Testament or words in the Old Testament. So there were quite a few and uh, uh, so I just say to the folks, if they get too uptight about uh, using the word inerrancy, I say, well, just tell me which manuscript is inerrant and let's follow it. But uh, there's the Greek Testaments that we have today, New Testaments, and the uh, Hebrew Old Testaments that we have, they're called eclectic texts. They're selected using uh, several different manuscripts uh, 
and they're saying, well, this manuscript was stronger in Isaiah, but not as good in the Proverbs. And so we'll go to another manuscript that's better. And uh, so I regularly say to students uh, uh, when I teach Greek that there's uh, no, you've got a Greek New Testament, but there's no manuscript in antiquity that looks like your Greek New Testament. And they look very puzzled. And I say it's eclectic. That means it's selected from various manuscripts. And text critical scholars have done a wonderful job. And I think we're as close to the New Testament uh, writings as we can get, unless another bunch of manuscripts are uh, prepared. But there was a lot of flexibility initially for several centuries in additions being made to manuscripts. And uh, so uh, most of the editions were very much orthodox, uh, and they followed the core teachings of the scriptures, and uh, they also simply wanted to expand or to clarify something. But once in a while, there's a, a strange uh, text that shows up, and we say, gee, where did that come from? So anyway, I don't. I I hope that's clear. But no, th 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 no, that's very clear. It's a very important, a very important thing. Like uh, the reliability and how how we can trust that the Bible that you have right now is is based on the hypothesis. So uh, the the thing that, for instance, uh, Daniel Wallace like suggests is that because there are so many manuscripts. Like for instance, I have here a replica of P fifty two. Of uh, yeah. John 18, for instance, I love this piece of piece of work. I love it. Um, uh, Mark, not John. Is it? Is this one for Mark? Oh yeah, oh, Mark was called John, oh, right? Excuse me, you're you're correct. Uh, there's another one of Mark that looks like that. No, uh, P52 is John. There's two of them, P52 and P90. But right. I'm glad to have that. Uh, I I've got a picture of that in uh, that book that you were showing. Yeah. Correct. Very yeah, good. exactly. Yeah, there's somewhere right in here, right? Yeah, this is yeah. John, John 1837. I have it on my YouTube channel where it says, yeah. um, those who are of the truth, follow me or hear me. That's exactly that P52 is saying. But yeah, anyway, yeah. but um, what I was trying to say is a friend of mine. Uh, we've had several meals together and uh, we went to college at the same school, but it, I was 10 years ahead of him. But if you have contact with Dan Wallace, tell him Lee McDonald said hello. So, oh, God willing, once uh, if I will have him on, I most certainly will. Yeah. Uh, but what, 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 what I was trying to say, as I meant or asked before, all the way throughout the uh, church history, 2000 year church history, there wasn't a particular moment where one guy or one council had complete monopoly over the biblical canon. Like a lot of people thought with the movie of Dan Brown that, that Constantine created the biblical canon of Nicaea, which is absolute bogus, right? Well, if, if you don't understand it, then you don't respect history. That being said, uh, but when someone asks, how do you actually know that the Bible that you have right here, right now in your hands is like the original Bible, is that because there are so many manuscripts, so many fragments, that uh, the probability of that it is uh, as it was at the time of Christ in the Old Testament is like, yeah, almost certain. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that with that thesis or premise? Well, uh, if I understood what you said, uh, there were a lot of manuscripts that were out there. They overlapped considerably with right. certain books. Uh, everybody wanted to have Genesis and Deuteronomy and uh, Exodus sometimes, but they preferred Deuteronomy over uh, Exodus. The books were not circulated together. Initially, they were in scrolls. And so you could see uh, the scroll of Isaiah would be quite a lengthy scroll. And so it was rolled up into one. And uh, the book of Revelation chapter five speaks about this scroll that's being opened up. Uh, most of them were written in scrolls, like you find in the Qumran community, not uh, not in codex or book form. But those are the kinds of things that uh, kept the order of the Bible uh, in flux for a number of centuries. Right. But yeah. oh, absolutely, yep. Yeah. That that's uh, those that's are the it, kinds. That's his scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the manuscripts often. Uh, would uh, 
the most popular ones that were kept by uh, Christians and Jews for quite some period of time were, again, Deuteronomy and uh, the Psalms and uh, Isaiah. And uh, but other uh, not all of the manuscripts were kept by any uh, all of the churches. It would be very rare to find a church that had more than a handful of books. Uh, the papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament, uh, there's uh, 128 of them right now, and, and actually it's going to go to even more, but only uh, two have more than uh, two books in them. And uh, uh, the uh, P72, of course, is, uh, and then P45, which is the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Those are the kinds of things. Uh, it's very rare to find uh, something with more than that. Uh, P46 is late second, early third century, and it has the letters of Paul, but not all of the ones that we attribute to Paul now. It doesn't have uh, the uh, uh, pastoral epistles in it. But if a church had the opportunity, generally churches would say, look, uh, Paul sent us this book uh, to our church here in Rome, and we heard that you have one uh, uh, that he sent to you in Corinth. Uh, could we send somebody over there and they'll make a copy? Or can you send somebody to make a copy of that and they will exchange copies? And churches exchange copies. And Paul speaks in Colossians 4, it's uh, verses 16 and 17, about uh, had this letter to the Laodiceans read, you know, in your church and take this one off over there to them. So they they swapped around and made use of. And so churches said, boy, that's a pretty good book. Let's make a copy of it while we've got it here. Thank you for letting us use it or something of that nature. And so the, the copyists were not literate scroll writers. Uh, they were not professional. They were generally uh, what Bruce Metzger in his book uh, on uh, New Testament uh, textual uh, uh, criticism, uh, he calls them literate amateurs, and amateurs make mistakes. And the oldest, oldest manuscripts that we do have, you can tell they were made by uh, amateurs. By the, by the fourth century, when the church, after the conversion of Constantine, they had more money, you start right. seeing much nicer produced manuscripts and they're beautiful three four columns instead of just one big column uh or sometimes two and uh, they're horizontally straight and not tilted or what have you and uh, there's no fakes in them let's not forget that in the first 300 years of the church the church was persecuted so yes. it, it, it wasn't the best of circumstances to create like the best manuscripts that the, that the, are, are to today's standards. So a lot of people forget that. Yeah. Well, but the quality of the manuscripts that were made during that period of time in the third and fourth centuries uh, had little to do with the persecution. It was, they wanted to make them. It was in the persecutions, many were destroyed. Okay. Um, manuscripts that were destroyed. And, uh, but churches were called upon to submit their manuscripts and uh, many did, but they submitted books they didn't like as much. Or uh, uh, that's why you'll find fewer copies of certain books, like the book of Hebrews. Some of the Gentile Christians didn't understand it. So uh, let's give that to the Romans. It's a larger book. Okay, and we'll, we'll give that to the Roman soldiers. Maybe that'll make them happy. We want to hold on to the gospel of Matthew uh, and uh, the one that Luke wrote or something of that nature. Uh, those kinds of things took place, and uh, as Christians, were uh, their books in the third century, uh, 250, 51, Decius, uh, the, uh, the uh, Roman emperor, uh, began persecuting them. They would uh, take the uh, Christians' uh, sacred books and burn them. The same thing took place in Diocletian in the early 300s, and so Christians lost their lives when they tried to uh, save their books or they wouldn't turn them over and then some turned over books that they didn't care much about and they said ah those don't infer inform our faith much and uh, but they were able afterwards after the conversion of Constantine when there was peace uh, to say yeah we've got these books and what books do you have and uh, hey 
uh, our church council is meeting and let's tell them what we like. And uh, church councils seldom made decisions. They generally just said what was operative in their regions. Right, operative in their, in their regions, yeah. Right, so the, 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 what I would like to go towards right now, as you already mentioned before at the very beginning, uh, our canon is Jesus. So uh, he is like the measuring stick stick of, of the, the, the ruling measure uh, by which we all things measure. But then we also, for instance, know in John uh, 20, uh, 30, 31, John says, for if we, if we would have written down everything Jesus has said and done, we didn't have enough room on the scroll. So yeah. there are things that have been said by Jesus that are unfortunately, as we can say in this day and age, that are not written down. The same thing goes towards Paul or the apostles. So there are there there is the written tradition and there's also the oral tradition. So then my question to you would be towards uh, what like the term the word of God, uh, the strict identity of that term. Would that be particularly only the written word, or also alongside with the oral tradition that comes along with it? I don't know if if I'm clear in my question. Yeah, uh, if I'm understanding you uh, clearly, the answer is yes to both, because as the proclamation was being proclaimed, it was the word of God that Paul proclaimed to the Corinthians and, and various ones, and that was before it was written down. Uh, and later on, uh, Paul's writings are the earliest writings we have in the New Testament, and the Gospels probably were written after uh, uh, the time of Paul, perhaps <clears throat> with Mark and Luke being two of the earlier Gospels, and uh, Matthew and John later after the death of Jesus. Uh, so uh, the Word of God was the message that Christ had to share and its implications, but the Old Testament scriptures did inform early Christians, uh, just like their Jewish siblings, uh, but uh, you don't have any list in the early churches of the books that they said these are inspired word of God and those are not. So the word of God was not anchored to the written text initially. Nowadays it is. Uh, after the Bible has been recognized by the churches, uh, it is. The Orthodox churches, uh, as we mentioned, they have what uh, they call the readables, uh, the Greek term that Athanasius had for them, uh, anagignos kamena, which uh, means readable text. Uh, they were not uh, heretical, but they were not canon. They weren't called scripture. Interestingly, the Orthodox churches generally accept only the books in their Old Testament that were recognized by the Jews, uh, the Masoretic text, uh, Tanakh is the term, the Torah, the uh, Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, that's the law of prophets and writings, uh, but they found some of them very valuable for reading. Uh, not everybody agreed on which books were valuable for reading in private, but uh, many of the churches and the church councils and many of the manuscripts include several of these uh, additional manuscripts along the way some were read like scripture right. and uh, some were not. The Catholic Church accepted their collection of 10 of them uh, as uh, sacred scripture and they mixed them in with the rest of the books of the Old Testament. The Orthodox churches, some of them mixed them in, but they said they were readables. They weren't canonical scriptures, but uh, I gave some lectures to an Orthodox uh, group in uh, Moscow uh, a few years ago and um, uh, we were having a discussion about what was scripture and what was not. And I said, you include these in your Bible and some of your Bibles, the Russian Bibles include them side by side, the canonical books, but some of them put them between the Old and New Testament like Martin Luther did. Right. And, uh, but they, they call them uh, uh, inspired, non-canonical Old Testament writings. And I said, that's a contradiction of terms. So we had a lot of laughter uh, in that, but the Catholics said, no, they are fully scripture. And so the Episcopalian churches and the Orthodox churches are pretty close because they make use of them. Uh, we have more than 13 
books in the uh, what's called the apocryphal books by Protestants or deuterocanonical by the Catholics. And uh, now some Orthodox Christians are using deuterocanonical. It's a second uh, uh, giving of the law. Those terms uh, still, I, I'm closer to the Orthodox than to the Catholics where I like some of them. There, there's some very good books uh, uh, and fascinating books. And Origen, uh, he liked Su the story of Susanna and Bell and the Dragon that was inserted into the book of Daniel and the, the uh, prayers and songs of the three young men that was inserted uh, into the uh, book of Daniel. Uh, uh, Tobit and uh, Judith, they're very interesting. And I love uh, uh, Sirach. Uh, it's a wisdom book. Uh, and I've often said to uh, Protestants that are opposed to anything that's called apocryphal. That's bad news. That's heretical stuff. It's not, most of it is not heretical. It's different, but uh, it's some fascinating stories and it helps us understand much of what's in the intertestamental period. And so I, I don't hesitate. I said, why don't you like to uh, be informed by the same books that informed some of the early Christians? But, but by the way, uh, uh, on this particular thing, um, uh, like a month ago, I I've wrote an article on academia.edu. Like I'm like I'm not a scholar, but I know that I can upload some 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 of my papers. I listed up uh, twenty examples where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is citing, alluding the Deuterocanon like twenty times, and oh, sure. And eight of them are, are directed towards Sir, like v verbatim uh, Greek words from, from the Septuagint, for instance. So when we already mentioned before that Jesus Christ is our canon, when Jesus himself is quoting uh, the Deuterocanon, that says a lot in my estimation. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Please send me a copy of that. I'd like to see sure. what you... 100%. 100%. Uh, I, I love quotes, you, you, you will see on this, on the, the left column, you will see the, the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, of course. And on the right side, you will see the uh, Deuterocanon. And then you will see exactly what uh, Jesus was, was quoting. Okay. Are you using the Greek? In, in, uh, uh, no, only, uh, only the English, uh, English translation. Okay. Now, uh, I, I regularly say that... Uh, uh, an uh, argument against those to say, well, none of those books are, are quoted as scripture uh, in the New Testament because they're not introduced was as the scripture says or uh, as it is written. Those were the common uh, introductions. And I said, but Jesus cited the book of Daniel without using that introduction, but clearly he cited it as scripture and he called Daniel a prophet. The book of Hebrews uh, only has one, it has more uh, percentage-wise quotes from the Old Testament than any other book of the New Testament, and it only has one reference where it entered, It doesn't introduce the text, it's found in Psalm 8, uh, it's quoting that, and it says, as it is written uh, in that quotation, but it has all kinds of quotations, and uh, of course, Wisdom of Solomon in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, is, I think, clearly cited, but people say, well, because it didn't use as it is written or as the scripture says, uh, then it can't be. And uh, that's when you find the book of Jude, verse 14, is a citation of First Enoch chapter 1, verse 9. Right. Uh, and yet Jude says, as the prophet, he prophesied. Enoch prophesied, saying, and they quote First uh, Enoch 1, verse 9. And I said, that's exactly what scripture is. It's prophesied writings. So yes, mm. there's a collection of writings that uh, Protestants, my tradition, oh, that's all pagan stuff. And no, oh, he didn't say as the scripture says, it just says he just prophesied. So I said, you don't understand how the Jews did scripture and how they understood it. So I fully agree right. with, I think your sentiment is there. Right, but th but then the 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 the, the Protestant um, appeal towards the Jews, like yeah, the Jews they they had like this uh, short list of kind of like Jerome cited or uh, yep. or like the, the Martin Luther was appealing to. But then the question is, and I, I would like to ask you if you would agree as well, which Jews, like the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, 
what time or like the Dead Sea Scrolls, it doesn't have the Maccabees and, and Sirach or it has fragments of it. But then, yet then again, it doesn't have uh, the Book of Esther. So when, when Protestants are using, I'm not trying to bash Protestants, obviously, but then the question is, if it comes to their argument, when they're appealing towards the Jews, my question would be, what Jews? And what would you reply on that, on All that right. question? I regularly say the first Christians were Jewish Christians. Uh, they were, uh, their Jewish brethren were siblings. Not all Jews held to the same collection of books that as sacred. And uh, probably the Sadducees had the most limited one, and that would have been more the Pentateuch or the Torah. Uh, but uh, the collection of the Essenes are probably the ones that housed the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they have among the almost a thousand now, and I put 900 in that little book that you showed up, but scholars are now saying there's probably uh, about a thousand manuscripts at Qumran. Just a little over 200 of them are of the biblical Old Testament books. 700 are of other books besides. And uh, I said, boy, that's quite a lopsided uh, imbalance. And there's several of uh, those books that there are more copies of them made, like in Jubilees and uh, the additional Psalms, uh, then there are of some of the, like the Chronicles or, uh, or uh, the Kings. There's only one paragraph of the Chronicles and a Harvard professor that I knew said, uh, had there been more worms in the cave, we wouldn't have uh, Chronicles in there. So uh, it was in a state of flux for quite some period of time. And so the biblical books that uh, we have were not exactly like the ones that you find at the Qumran. Though most of the books that we have in our Old Testament were found at Qumran, but you do find some of the deuterocanonical books and some that were now called pseudepigrapha, like First Enoch. Uh, there are copies of First Enoch there, possibly 11 copies. It depends on how you uh, tally some of the manuscripts. But those are the kinds of things that we need to be mindful of. Uh, the Christians... Uh, first scriptures, the Jewish Christians were the ones that were like their Jewish siblings. And so their Jewish siblings and the early Christians uh, agreed with uh, similar uh, uh, sacred texts, uh, probably closer to the Pharisees and the Essenes than to the uh, Sadducees or the Herodians. Uh, Jesus cites a, a phrase in uh, Matthew 19, verse 28, where he says, uh, the son of man coming, sitting on his throne of glory. You find that also in Matthew 25, verse 31. The only other place those words are found, the son of man sitting on his throne of glory is in uh, first Enoch. And it's in the parables of Enoch. And I've written some stuff on that. But uh, the the Bibles that we have today are not exactly like the earliest collections that the, uh, the uh, Jewish Christians had or those that were circulating in the first century. It, uh, I, I remember talking to a, a Jewish scholar. Uh, we were at a conference together and we were stuck in a hotel room waiting for our ride to pick us up to go to the airport. And uh, he was trying to tell me that uh, the 22 books of the Old Testament were the only ones. And then he was willing to say 24, but it's the same books divided separately. Um, anyway, right. when was the very first time that the books of the Hebrew Bible were listed? It's found in a Baraita, uh, which is a, an additional supplementary text that's found written about 180 to 200 AD. And even then, they don't call it uh, Torah Nevim and Ketuvim, or Law, Prophets, and Writings, they only say Law and the Prophets uh, right up until about the end of the fourth, uh, early 5th century AD in the rabbinic tradition. The scriptures of the Jews were in a state of flux for several centuries, and there were five books in the Old Testament that the rabbinic uh, sages were debating well into the fourth century. And uh, early Christians were doing some of the similar kinds of things. Sometimes they debated the same books as to whether Esther should be in, in, included 
or Ecclesiastes uh, because of negativity. That's so, funny. That's very funny. Because yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's actually very funny that, that those two groups, I want to say, uh, parallel are like debating on what their canon should be. Because there, uh, there was also uh, the Council of Yamnia at, at the early, early second, first uh, century, where uh, yeah. the Jews were also disputing what then should be that what then as, as the Jews should be doing that the count that the temple was broken down and the canon and those type of stuff so they were also in a certain type of flux that's very well, interesting I, yeah. Yeah, uh, I would take exception to that uh, that was an older view that the Jewish scriptures were settled at the council of Jamnia that was a council that gathered together at about 98 somewhere between 70 and 90 AD and uh, and the issue is how do we as Jews continue as Jews without the uh, sacrificial system? That was the primary right. issue. They never debated. There was a couple of questions about a couple of books, but they didn't debate the scope of the uh, Hebrew uh, scriptures. And that doesn't come out until much later. And there never was a council among the Jews to say these books and no others. The rabbis uh, into the books that now are in our Hebrew Bible but interestingly, the Jews in the rest of the diaspora, the rest of the Greco-Roman world, were still using the Septuagint with the additional books up until 8th, 9th century AD. Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't, yeah. I didn't write that down. 8th, 9th century. Yeah, I Jews can, uses, uh, wow. Yeah, send me a, a note and I'll send you a, a manuscript. Uh, uh, I don't have the manuscript with me except in printed form, but... Uh, I can tell you where you can get it. And there were two Jews that were writing on that, Aria Edre and uh, 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 Doran Mendels, uh, two Jews in, wow. uh, uh, currently that said uh, the Jews to from Palestine going east uh, were the ones that bought into the 24 books or the 22 books. And those to the north, to the south, and to the west bought into far more for many centuries. And guess why? The Jews in Palestine and to the east in Babylon only spoke in Hebrew or Aramaic, and the rest of the Jews in the Greco-Roman world spoke Greek. And which scriptures did they read? They wrote, uh, they read the, yeah, the, uh, the Greek scriptures. And uh, those included more books uh, than what are in the, the others. And there were no uh, Hebrew schools in the west, going west to Palestine, or even to the north or to the south for centuries. And uh, so uh, the, whatever Jewish traditions were being circulated by the rabbinic Jews would not have been familiar to the Jews, say, in Rome or uh, uh, Gaul, uh, modern-day France, or places like that. Wow. So that, that, that's that, an, uh, distinction. Most folks do not grasp that. Uh, the, the the time the Old Testament was always disputed, and all of the Christians have never agreed on the same books, except they all agree on the the books of the Hebrew Bible, but others have have more. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. So yeah, yeah, if 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 you would if you would be able one day, that would be absolutely terrific because that is a solid yeah. goal that you have right there. Yeah, yeah. reference. It's about a sixty-page document. And it's well documented, and uh, they just show where the Jews to the west uh, were ignored by those in the east, and uh, the rabbinics wanted to stay only with Aramaic and uh, Hebrew, but uh, the other Jews throughout the Greco-Roman world spoke Greek for the yeah. most part. And so, yeah, but but that, but then my next question would be, and by the way, we also have this time limit anyway. But the, but then my next question would be. Uh, wouldn't you think that one of the reasons why the Jews omitted, uh, for instance, the books of the, the Deuterocanon uh, from the Septuagint was because it was helping the Christians? Don't you think that there was also this anti-Christian sentiment why they omitted those books? Uh, not the time. Uh, by the time when they were largely being ignored, uh, the persecutions against the Christians by the Jews was quite limited. Uh, there were, and there were probably about 100,000 Christians by the end of the first century. There were 6 million Jews. 
So when you think of that 60 to 1 ratio, they could ignore the Christians, uh, but they didn't ignore them, and there were they would report them to the Romans for a period of time. But uh, the uh, Jews, uh, let me just share this with you. The 22 books that uh, uh, Josephus mentions, that there were 22 books and nobody's added to them, and uh, every Jew would give his life, that's hyperbole, uh, to protect them. Uh, what were the 22? Uh, they're probably the same as the 24 that the rabbis took. 22 was the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 24 the number of letters in the Greek alphabet. How many books do the Protestants have in their Old Testament? 39, which is exactly the same books. The Jews combined books so they could come up with the 22 or the 24, because those numbers were divine numbers. The numbers of the letters of the alphabet were divine numbers. Uh, primary example, uh, Homer, he wrote two books, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Did you know that each of those books has 24 chapters and each is uh, started with a letter of the Greek alphabet in each book? So uh, 24 books in uh, uh, the Iliad, 24 books in the Odyssey. And uh, there was a cult of Homer in Alexandria, Egypt, started by Alexander the Great and to honor. And those were the, the books that the children would learn in school. So the Jews, because of the popularity of the number 24 as a divine number, said these 24, but Ruth was uh, combined with judges and uh, the Chronicles were one book, the Kings one book and so on. And the 12 uh, minor uh, prophets, the shorter prophets were combined into one book and it's just called the 12. And so uh, each of those minor prophets was written individually and uh, we separate them in our Bibles, in the Protestant Bibles, uh, and Orthodox and, and Catholic in the Christian Bibles, but uh, they were not combined uh, in the Jews because they wanted to come up with that sacred number. That meant they were all holy. What if they had kept Sirach, uh, which was called scripture by the rabbinic Jews? There's 20 different references in the uh, 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 but they would they have had to find another way to combine them uh, to uh, be able to allow them to stay in their 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 scriptures. By the it's way, uh, one, one, one second. 